Welcome everybody to another Golden Dudes Game Breakdown. My name is Nick. I'm Mike. And we're going to be talking about Dragon Quest XI today, which is a pretty good game, I would have to say. Um, I think it's pretty obvious if we're doing a game breakdown of it. We obviously had a pretty great time with the game. Or we did it like a joke, kind of like with the Hello Kitty Cruisers, which was... Wait, was that actually a game breakdown or was that like an announcement for the... April Fool's Game Breakdown, baby. That's what it was. So we're going to be doing this one... Um, <laughs> Definitely a little bit of a minor like a minor spoiler warning for this game because we're probably gonna be starting uh, We're gonna try to keep it spoiler free But like halfway through the game and some of like the later parts like if we're gonna be mentioning it that we liked it We're probably gonna spoil some of it. So minor spoilers, but we're not gonna like tell you I don't know like what the final boss fight is like or anything like that anyway, but general impressions Mike I adored this game <laughs> um so it's kind of funny. I, I don't remember, like, when I started playing the game. I know Nick, like, told me that he really liked it. Uh, I don't remember, like, if it was, like, an immediate after or if I was just like, oh, I, I, I saw it on the store randomly. Actually, never mind. I did just remember now. <laughs> uh, it went on Game Pass for, for Xbox Series. Uh, and it was like, as soon as it came out of Xbox, they, they put it up for free on Game Pass. And I saw it, and I'm like, oh, I remember Nick played that game, and he really liked it. I'm like, I'll give it a shot. It's free. Why not? Um, I didn't have like super big expectations because I know Dragon Quest is very like traditional JRPG and so I kind of figured it would be like a textbook run-of-the-mill RPG um, similar to like old Final Fantasy um, but I was super pleasantly surprised mm -hmm. uh, like the the level of like care and detail that went into this game was so cool um, and it wasn't like super gritty and dark the way that like some Final Fantasy or JRPGs try to be um, there were some like pretty malicious things that happened in it but it had a very comical undertone um, and it felt very even like in the darkest things that I'm sure we'll talk about later uh, it still felt very like um, optimistic, I guess you could mm -hmm. say, at least in terms of like the graphical style and the, the characters and how they work, uh, which I thought was really cool. It was kind of a a much more positive style of JRPG, um, and it was traditional, but it, it like I couldn't get away from it, which I was very surprised by because there's a lot of JRPGs I take extended breaks from, kind of mm -hmm. like Nick's Persona Five stint. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I've done that quite a few times, uh, but this one I didn't. This one I kind of played pretty much start to finish, so I really enjoyed this one. I would have to agree with everything you said. Um, one of the things that I think is really cool, uh, obviously I think the kind of, uh, and maybe this is more of a nostalgic taste, especially coming from like me and people who are like my age, who grew up on say like Dragon Ball or Dragon Ball Z. Um, a lot of those, I mean, it's the same artist that's creating these characters. It's Akira Toriyama. So a lot of these kind of, at least this kind of style of, uh, of animated characters is already familiar to us, is already ones that like we see and we kind of like seeing that character. But what's also really cool about that is you kind of go into it with that knowledge, but at the same time, it really is just a charming aesthetic that is carried all throughout the game and all the characters and all the enemies. And I know we're going to be talking about enemies later on and the landscape and the, uh, and the architecture of the worlds and everything. And one of the things that I liked about it is while everything felt planned, it felt calculated. It kind of reminds me of the way like, and maybe this is not the same comparison that a lot of people would use, but like Nabuo Uematsu's music, it's very planned and structured but it doesn't ever feel in that it feel in that vein because really dragon quest as a series has never really evolved it's been a typical mm -hmm. turn-based rpg from the very beginning all the way to what it's like in the very end and i think a lot of people who have started playing uh, rpgs like that say maybe like around the 90s in the 2000 uh, early 2000s kind of long i mean this is just my uh speculation long for a game that's like that and I feel like that kind of experience is not being given with no with the modern Final Fantasy games, which is kind of unfortunate, but it's really cool to see that there is still a game series that's able to feel like the game that, like the RPG that they really like to have. But what's also crazy to me, and one of the things that I think might be uh, a good sp a springboard to the next part of the discussion is, why do you think that a game like this is doing so, or did so well to start? Because... I have my theories, but on paper, this is the exact game that a lot of game companies try to avoid. It's not doing anything risky. It's doing everything planned and calculated. It's a turn-based RPG, so it's not really doing anything challenging in the battling system. And honestly, when it comes down to levels, it's they do some unique stuff, but it's still fairly basic. And I think the simplicity has a lot to do with it, but before I give my take, I want to know what you think. Yeah, I, well, I think there's a lot of things. Um, 
I, I feel like there's so many different directions I can go with this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I feel like a big piece of this too is kind of like you were talking about, there's so many games that have drifted away from turn-based combat or have just gone in some weird direction like Paper Mario, for example, and like you said, Final Fantasy. Um, and even like Pokemon to a certain extent, it's still turn-based, but like mm -hmm. it's, it's definitely way different than it used to be. Um, so I feel like there's almost some comfort in the idea that there's a franchise that is still traditional. That's kind of what dragged me into this is I was like, oh, okay, this is like the, the old style, but it to me, it doesn't look intimidating. And mm -hmm. I think that's the other big thing too, is there's a lot of games like Octopath Traveler and um, mm -hmm. I can't remember what it's called. The one that I, I started and I didn't finish that was on the Switch that you and Travis both played. I am sad You made a video I'm on guessing. it. I'm guessing. I am sad Which one? Yes, that one. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That that look amazing, but they, they feel a little more intimidating, just like with their menus and kind of the setup. Um, I think this game had a charm that almost just made it seem very, very entry level to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I kind of like I said with the charisma and stuff, I just feel like this game looks very appealing and open to play. Um, so I feel like people that may be originally turned away from turn-based combat mm -hmm. uh, can see a game like this and be like, okay, this one doesn't look like a terrible one to jump into. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's why this one too, above all the others, kind of blew up. Um, you know, I, I, like most of the other Dragon Quests, I've never even seen anyone talk about any other Dragon Quest. Um, there's a couple, um, but this is like the big one, I feel like. Um, and I think that's part of the reason why. I think it's the graphical style, the way it's laid out. Um, it, it it feels easy to get into, and it, and it is. It's a very smooth transition for uh, veterans and new people for this type of game. Mm -hmm. I 100% agree. What I also like about this game too, and uh, I'm not sure I might be might be taking it in the other direction that you were thinking of too, but like one of the things that I do think is nice about this game as well is that um, none. Of, I, I agree. It's more. It's definitely more entry level. But what you're saying before, I guess I want to bring it back to Dragon Quest VII. I played that, the remake for the 3DS. And to mm -hmm. be honest, I never really thought, and I know we've probably talked about this off screen, but this is the first time I believe mentioning it, probably like not on stream. It, either way, this is the first time when I ever felt like I was really getting into a Dragon Quest game. When I played Dragon Quest VII, I believe it's Fragments of the Forgotten Past for the 3DS, I liked the game. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to deny that. But what I liked about it wasn't really like... I didn't really get as much of a charm of the characters or um, or like a feel of the battle system. What I liked about it was the diversity of the class changing system and the different uh, ways that you can do, use it in combat. Um, but a lot of RPGs can do that and a lot of RPGs do that well. So when I played Dragon Quest VII, nothing really felt specially unique about it, which is kind of weird because I'm saying the same thing about Dragon Quest XI, but I'm, we're raving about <laughs> that game and I'm saying a lot of good things about it. And one of the reasons I think that is I think one of the main reasons was the characters. And this is going to be driving into the uh, to one of our first topics, is that the characters of the game, I think, is what actually make it, really make it a good RPG that I feel like you kind of, like, vibe with, I guess, if you want to use that word. The... You still are, you still are with, like, your... If some people call Bland, but the unspoken protagonist that is pretty much a blank slate that, honestly, is almost impossible to mess up, but... Every single character that gets like announced that like, that like joins the party, I feel stands out in their own individual way. Some of them better than others, but like like I'll be honest, Eric. I no offense to Eric, <laughs> I don't think that Eric <laughs> in the game uh, really stuck out as much as say like uh, say like Rab or Jade. But every single character that came into the uh, that came into the game, I felt had a very nice appeal and synergy with the rest of the cast. It feels like I'm using corporate words right now when I say synergy, but <laughs> it really does feel like they blended together to make a very appealing cast. And I can't say that about Dragon Quest VII. Dragon Quest VII had a couple of good characters, but the character that I liked was the one with say like the dog and the human brain that, or the kid brain that was swapped and his name was Ruff. It's like, okay, he's a dog. You can't mess up a dog <laughs> either. So right. all of the characters I felt were definitely more endearing for one. And while, uh, I, I guess I can just I guess I can just say that like maybe you might might not have been fans of some of like the old man trope but even though a lot of the characters might have fallen into the same pattern I never felt that they didn't really feel like a trope to me because I never really felt I feel like there's certain ways you can make the game that doesn't feel tropey and I feel like Dragon Quest avoided a lot of the pitfalls in that way it's kind of a scattered point but I do think that Dragon Quest 11 made their trope characters not feel like they were just cut and paste characters that you can put in any RPG. They felt specifically designed for the Dragon Quest game that they're making, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I get what you're saying. Um, and 
like I, I I agree with the fact that like this cast of characters, it's so rare in a JRPG where I, I not only do I like all the characters, mm -hmm. but then even in a lot of ways, I felt like they were all useful. Um, it, like I, I felt like I could put any of them in my party at any point, and they would be useful in a certain way. Um, I, I have to give them props for that because I think for the the final dungeon, I did end up using every single character at some point, oh, I didn't. Um, <laughs> which is something I have never said in the game. Mm -hmm. um, but and that's and obviously there's characters that are better than others. Like characters, like you said, like Eric, kind of get left in the dust. Mm -hmm. um, but it's the fact that you can keep him at a point where he can be useful mm -hmm. um where there's games like final fantasy 10 where you have kamari who is a complete waste of space at no matter what you do like he Agreed. was just pointless to me um but like in this game i felt like all my party members were pretty useful mm -hmm. um and, and that kind of that that was cool uh, but then also i just the their personalities um, I, I really, really liked, and I think they did a good job of making the cast a likable group. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the other thing, too, is there's so many games that someone in the group is kind of an asshole, or is kind of weird. You got, like, Kate Sith from Final Fantasy VII, <laughs> and it's like, why the hell is this person here? This thing, actually. Um, but, like, everyone in this cast was really, really cool. Um, you know, I, like you said, Eric is kind of forgotten, but the good thing about him is he was kind of like the tutorial guy. Mm -hmm. He was just kind of your bro, you know, that was there to, to walk you through. And, and the only one that was, like, iffy to me was Silvando up until mm -hmm. the whole second act kind of strikes yeah. with the disaster and everything. And, like, you know, the whole thing he does with, and I guess you said spoiler, so I'll say yeah, it, uh, say like, it. with the whole parade that yeah. was, was so tacky, but it was so charming. Uh, and I was like, all right, this is a legitimate guy because at first he seems, like, cocky and arrogant. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it's like, oh, okay, he is, but he wants to use that to to make the world a better place. Yeah. Um, and I was like, okay, so they, they all have, like, their traits, but they're, they, they use them in a positive way. There was no one that I'm like, oh, my God, this person sucks. I don't want them in my party. Yeah, and at the beginning, I remember I used to think Sylvan was like way over the top especially when it went into like the parade mm -hmm. and everything but i think they knew exactly what they're doing and they went over the top to the point where it's just like even if you think it's over the top and we know people are going to think that like i did there's like we're going to go even more overboard so you're going to laugh at it too so even though i was like this is too much i was still laughing at it because i was just like this is hysterical the fact that they just they went full speed ahead and i thought it was amazing <laughs> I, th I thought it was a great decision to make so yeah. yeah, no, it, it, they, they had great. so many great character decisions. And another thing that I liked about it is, yes, you have your designated, like, tank, healer, mage, whatever. Um, even characters like Eric, I want to say, like, it was really cool because he did still have a, a moveset unique to him. Like, he was definitely more about, like, damage over time and being, eva and being evasive and using poison over time for... Uh, First damage and whatnot, and while that again didn't really translate as much to the very later game, uh, to the later game, where you're using like Silvando can like buff up your whole party like crazy. Like I'll be honest, Silvando was my most used character besides the main guy because mm -hmm. his buffs that he gave to the party were just too good. Just accelerate yeah. and like decelerate and the like the oomph attack boost and whatnot were just too good to ignore. So Silvando was almost a mainstay in my party until the very very end, pretty much. And like Silvando, I don't think I used in the final dungeon, but. Either way, every character I felt had a very nice role that they played in the uh, in the party, which was awesome. And I feel like a lot of RPGs can struggle to do that, and whether some of them try to either go for too big of a cast or try to keep it as like a tight-knit group of four, they have their pros and cons. Like, Bravely Default, you have a group of four, and you know all these people very well and very in-depth, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you might feel like you want to reach out and talk to other characters because we're stuck with these people for a whole entire game. I think Dragon Quest yeah. had uh, Dragon Quest 11 had the right amount of people and the right kind of characters to do it well. But that is going to spring over to the leveling system, as I was mentioning for combat, which was kind of cool for Eric, where, again, like he did a lot of the skills that he inherits, a lot of the abilities that he gets really match his kind of, uh, his kind of class structure, uh, which was nice. But one of the things that I really liked about it, and it seems like it's Square Enix, so they might have been taking a piece of uh, piece of advice from Final Fantasy X, was that kind of, uh, it wasn't the sphere grid, but that kind of hexagonal grid that you had as, mm -hmm. a, as a leveling system. And I really liked it. Um, one of the things that I did really like is it definitely lets you prioritize different abilities that you can see way ear earlier if you want to. So you can hold off on making like, on just trying to get every ability that you want. And again, like I mentioned, I used Silvando before because he had an ability that would allow you to restore like 70 or 140 HP to everybody right away. And I made, and like I focused hard on that ability and then Silvando was able to make a lot of those dungeons and fights way easy for a while. So I was gonna ask what you thought about the leveling system and what, what are the high points and low points? 
Uh, I liked it. And I have another thing I want to say later, too, okay. about something I didn't like. Okay. Uh, <laughs> not really with leveling system, but with about how you level up. But, okay. <laughs> uh, the actual grid itself I really liked. And I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier, too, about like how easy this game is to get into. Mm -hmm. Is It's a very easy level up system to like understand. Um, because even if you don't really understand like the pieces and like what the best skills are, um, the benefit is you can reset it. Um, and I, I love games that do that, so you're not committed into anything. Mm -hmm. Let's say you pick the wrong skill, you can kind of just reset the whole thing and then kind of build from scratch. Um, and I, I, I really, really like that feature. Um, so in case you're new and you're like, oh my god, my, my, my Sylvandos like build is is absolutely shitty mm -hmm. uh, i'm just gonna reset the dial and you know like buy some skills back and kind of rebuild um so i i loved it um and i thought it was cool too that each character kind of had its own different pathway in it um so you can have a character be more of a a mage let's say or more of a a melee person particularly like you know rab had his uh, like fisticuffs path i could be wrong I, it's been yeah, a while but yeah, like i think it's like that a staff path and, and then fist. Right, like and then there, I want to say there was like magic and heal. Like they just had like their different their different paths for the weapons you want to use. Mm -hmm. um, and and again, it was easy to switch from one path to another. Um, and in fact, I did that at one point. I remember my initial rap build was different, and then when you kind of get it back later and refill the stats, I ended up filling it up somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, kind of like got to mix it up. So I like how fluid it was. It was very flexible. Um, one thing I do want to say that I didn't like is mm -hmm. I did not like how you level up. Um, in, in terms of getting the skills, um, not even that it was grindy, because I understand that some games like this are going to be grindy. Uh, my least favorite thing in this entire game was metal slimes. I they yeah. were the bane of my existence. Uh, the fact that the the best way to level up is getting really really lucky that mm -hmm. a metal slime does not run from you. I hated that because there'd be times where you find like a a king metal slime that mm -hmm. gives you like ten thousand XP, and you can level up like two times in one go, and it runs away, and you're stuck grinding for an hour to get that same experience. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that's awful. Like, don't tease me like that. If yeah. it's a rare encounter, like, let me at least get it when it shows up, because um, it it would be cool if you got it more frequently but the fact that they run away so often it was just always frustrating to yeah. the point where it would show up and i'd be annoyed i'm mm -hmm. like because it's just gonna break my heart again uh, yeah. i i did not like the metal slimes uh, no i i agree the metal slimes were a pain in the ass i think it's kind of a dragon quest staple which is why they had it i'm just trying to mm -hmm. see where the developers were coming from but yeah coming as like a person who only played one dragon quest game before that it is definitely a pain where it's like you can save a lot of time but you gotta act quick because otherwise it's gonna run away and i'm, yeah. maybe, I'm guessing there's actually ways but from a casual standpoint you don't actually know when they're gonna run away or how many how much time you get before they run away which is kind of tough to have so yeah no i agree with that it's it's very very frustrating but one of the things i want to mention about the leveling system as well just a small point because pretty much you covered everything that i was going to say about it but uh, what I want to say is about uh, Serena and Veronica's leveling system and what happens mm -hmm. of that later on. That is actually a pretty big spoiler, so I'm not going to actually say exactly what happens. But for those of you, those of the people who have actually played Dragon Quest XI and know what I'm talking about when it comes down to Serena and Veronica's leveling uh, uh, leveling grid, I think it was a super cool way to like incorporate it later on. So mm -hmm. not going to give that away, but just want to touch on it because I thought it was a really creative thing to do. Yeah. So uh, going up to next. Next topic is going to be the Mini Forge. First of all, I think this was one of the um, most amazing additions created into the game. I don't know why I was so head over heels about this, but one of the things that was cool and especially a great way to encourage exploration when it comes down to these open world games, well, kind of open world, it's kind of on a linear path. It's not really, doesn't really divert too much from, uh, from the path that you're taking, but you can find recipes. You can find uh, ways to create other, uh, say, pieces of armor, uh, swords, um, the shields, whips, whatever weapon you want. I think whips was a weapon, I can't remember. Um, but whatever the weapon is, you can find ways to do that. And as long as you're collecting materials as you're going uh, going around the world, and you're just exploring like usual, at least that's what I did, you would have more than enough materials to be able to forge these. And what I liked about it is, as long as you were able to understand the forge and do it well, you would always get a very slight boost, not game breaking, but a very slight boost that was better than a lot of the weapons or the or the gear that you could get at the shop. And the way that they structured it, and might not do the best job of explaining this, but you start off at a certain temperature and you get a limited amount of hits to be able to try to forge it into the shape that it wants. If you hit it at a high temperature, you're going to be able to do more of, uh, more of the shaping. Uh, once it gets lower and lower uh, for the forge, it's not going to be able to do as much uh, per hit. So it's kind of like a mini game of managing 
when the forge is high, which places you want to hit to hit that little target, and when it's lower to be more precise to get it to whatever the, uh, the exact points it needs to get that boost that you want, like a plus three or a plus two boost. So it was kind of a glorified mini game, but I feel like it gave very tangible real world effects that you, that you had in battle that I thought was a great addition. So do you have any thoughts on the forging? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I mean, you said a lot of it, and I, I, I loved it. Yeah. Uh, it's funny, when when I play Western RPGs, I am mm -hmm. all about, like, 100% and completing everything. Totally not like that with JRPGs. Mm -hmm. I'm very much like, I just want to beat the game because I'm there for the story. Yeah. I don't even really ever really look for side content or side quests. So yeah. in most games, when it comes to, like, customizing weapons and doing things like that, um, I, I rarely ever do it if there's, like... Like, I've been playing uh, Xenoblade Chronicles lately, yeah. and they have the, uh, I forgot what they're called, the little, like, gems you put in for your abilities. Yeah. Never once look for those things, ever. I don't even really look for equipment. I just, I'm there for the story and exploring. You don't um, even need them, but too, it's though, funny technically. The, <laughs> what, what was that? You don't even need those, technically. I mean, the gem forging is, like, completely, I mean, it helps a lot if you want to take on some of, like, the, the super bosses. You never need them. <laughs> you'll yeah, find and more, I have no desire them. to do that. Yeah. As soon as, like... When the guide shows up and it's like more than two pages long, it's like I don't, I don't <laughs> want to learn this. I'm good. Um, but the the mini forge I did get into, mm -hmm. um, and again, it's been the theme. I've said it over and over because it's easy to use. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's really simple. It, like I'm always kind of worried about trying to jump into that stuff, but then I did it, and I'm oh, okay. It's not hard. Like Nick was saying, it's like you just kind of figure the temperature out. You can hit certain spots with different moves. The more you unlock them, like mm -hmm. it's really not that hard to do. Mm -hmm. um, and and you do get an easy boost in equipment. And it's also not like you need to grind super hard to find rare materials to mm -hmm. get good equipment. Um, you pretty much have everything you need at all times to get decent equipment um if you want like the best of the best yeah you got to do some searching mm -hmm. um but to get like good equipment you really don't need anything like that um and they did a good job of making it stay relevant all the way to the end of the game mm -hmm. um so i i, I loved it. it it was easy to use it was quick to learn i didn't have to like read through pages of like you know instructions mm -hmm. um, i think it was a great addition and i like the fact that you brought up the gem forging in xenoblade chronicles and while i believe uh because i can't remember off the top of my head but i don't believe x or xenoblade chronicles 2 has the gem forging but i do remember doing this gem forging in xenoblade chronicles and how much of a chore that was mm -hmm. and while yes it did give very very good buffs to the rest of your party or whoever had the gems which was helpful i'm not gonna lie it was very helpful to do it but it was not easy to learn it was not intuitive it took a long time and the reward was technically based on the time investment was minimal because you could do the same yeah. kind of level grinding and get the same kind of, well, not the same kind of buffs, but you could do a lot of the same stuff and just level grind up to the point that you need. Yeah, maybe some of the stuff later in the game that are some of the harder enemies. Yeah, it would be helpful to have some of the like aggro up five or the or the uh, ranged attack up four gems or something like that. But they're never really needed to do. And again, it was a very optional thing to do. I actually feel like the gem forging in Xenoblade is actually more important or more critical to do than the forging in Dragon Quest, because technically you can just buy the weapon at the store. And depending on what difficulty you're playing on, like if you're playing on normal, I don't think you ever need to use the forge because I don't think the game's right. really difficult at all anyway mm. but it does offer a nice boost to people who want to do that and i'll be honest i like tested almost every recipe i could because i thought it was just fun because it's a little yeah. puzzle so i like that um but yeah i think xenoblade can sometimes commit the cardinal sin of a jrpg where it focuses a little too much on grinding and I, it's definitely bad for two uh x is bad with the money for sure i do think the original xenoblade is the best but sorry getting a little off topic i agree that xenoblade uh the gem the gem crafting some people like it i actually read people who made pages and pages of stuff on how to optimize the system oh, the I best pairings and i'm just like just give me an aggro up five i just want this tank to focus all the hits <laughs> on this motherfucker like it's right. i don't want to take it to that much depth but either way it was pretty cool uh this one uh, probably one a topic that everybody expects us to talk about. Soundtrack. Um, it's pretty fucking good. Like, mm -hmm. it's really, really good. Uh, <laughs> what's crazy is that I believe in the beginning, and this might be a little bit of a... This might be me remem not remembering my history as much, but in the beginning of this game, I believe there was a pretty big debate. Uh, maybe not as much of a debate, but more criticism on not having an orchestrated soundtrack for a Dragon Quest game. And people who have played Dragon Quest games in the past have known the sound to be very distinct, like Final Fantasy music. You can really tell, uh, or at least maybe this is just some people being a little more nitpicky and they have 
better ears or something. But like you might, be, you'll be able to tell the difference between like the Final Fantasy VII music and the Final Fantasy X music when, say, like Nobuo Uematsu started getting a little more help from um, crap, not Yasunori Nishiki. Who's the guy uh, who did Final Fantasy XIII? Mas Masashi Hamauzu, sorry. Masashi Amauzu, who started taking on a lot more of the burden of the music later on. And you can kind of see the the change of musical direction when it came with Final Fantasy. And honestly, when you get to, like, that many mainline entries, it does make sense to have the music go through kind of a change there. Because if you're hearing the same music in Final Fantasy III that you're hearing in Final Fantasy VIII, yeah, you're probably going to get bored of it. But what's cool about, this, about the Dragon Quest soundtracks is... It never really followed that. It always had a very lighthearted feel, a very jovial mood to it. And as you're going through the game, yeah, you can see like, for example, like a bird on a on a skull or whatnot that you're facing, and it'll just give you like that ba 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 ba. Like it's it's keeping you on your toes, but it's not making you think like things are like dark and gloomy and everything's bad. There are parts in the game that kind of do lean that way, but when you're in the game though, that orchestrated soundtrack carries so well that it became like an identity of the Dragon Quest uh, the Dragon Quest name. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. The the music it's funny. Um I I really like it. I, I think the soundtrack in it's solid. Um the one thing that really always sticks out to me that I, I didn't particularly enjoy at the end of the game was the overworld theme. Because uh, you hear it over and over and over again. And it, I, I didn't like that every time you came out of a fight, it would, like, restart. And it was one of those things that it's like, oh, mm -hmm. my gosh. Uh, it, I, it just it got repetitive to me. And yeah. I, I think what I wish is that maybe different sections of the world, like, there was more overworld themes. Mm -hmm. um, but, I like, I felt like you just you hear it constantly. Um, and it just it, it, it got kind of old, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not even that the music was bad. I didn't think the music was bad at all. Um, it's just that I felt like, at a certain point, I was I was almost tired of it. Kind of like y everyone has a favorite song, uh, but if you listen to it a million times in a row, you're like, okay, mm -hmm. I don't want to listen to the song anymore. Yeah. That's kind of what I felt about Dragon Quest. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's where a lot of the controversy in the soundtrack lies, um, is the fact that it's a good soundtrack, um, but it's just kind of repetitive, you know? And I mean, and I feel the same way about Pokemon. Um, I love the Pokemon soundtrack. I think it's great, but my gosh, by the end of playing a Pokemon game, if I played it for a long time, I'm really fucking sick of the songs of Pokemon. Yeah, uh, especially I, the I intros. Don't, it's hard for JRPGs to kind of avoid that. Mm -hmm. Persona 5 does a great job, but I, I mean, Persona 5 is repetitive, but at least its song is really damn good. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, I just, I don't think the overworld theme here is good enough to, like, overcome that, mm -hmm. like, the way Persona 5's was. Yeah. Um, so I don't know, that's how I feel. The soundtrack was good, it, I just got tired of it, I guess. Yeah. No, I, I can I can understand that perspective. And honestly, I think it's tough because really the only song that I haven't like fallen in love with of the Persona 5 series is like the Memento song, and that's the same reason. It mm -hmm. gets very repetitive, but I feel like yeah. the, Memento, uh, the Memento's music is actually meant to be like in the background and you're not supposed to be focusing on it, but I was focusing on it for such a long time and I just have that theme but in the back of my head and I'm like, okay, I get it. And it actually caused me to meet my TV right. one time because I was just like, I just don't want to hear it anymore. But I, yeah. I do, I do understand your uh, your uh, your feeling for uh, for the Dragon Quest music because I do, I do feel that. I didn't feel that when it came down like the battle theme, but the overworld theme, I can yeah, definitely understand so. that because I did like the battle. Mm -hmm. theme. Um, but yeah, I do think that uh, especially when it comes down to music, because I also tried listening to say like a Dragon Quest Eight soundtrack. Obviously not the whole thing, but like a couple of the, uh, pieces of music and also not Dragon Quest Eleven. I think it was Dragon Quest. It's one of them for the DS. Maybe when they did Dragon Quest Nine. I can't remember which one it was, because I know that there's a remake of 8 for the 3DS, which for some reason is like $200 now, which is ridiculous. I have no idea why that's the case. It's crazy. I'm sure you can buy it on the eShop for like 40 bucks, but whatever. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So when it comes down to the, when it comes down to those games, like I started like feeling like how it was like a distinctly Dragon Quest soundtrack, and I liked it because um, I don't know. It felt more unique as an RPG. I feel like a lot of RPGs really strive for that high octane high action like the final fantasy 7 is like da, 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 like they yeah. try to strive for that but i do like the fact that dragon quest was able to give you a more like pumped up feeling in their music with stay with the with still being more laid back i guess it's kind of right. it's music it's hard to explain but like it keeps you on your feet but it doesn't try to push you over and get you like overly pumped up about the fight so that's what i, mm -hmm. I really did enjoy the soundtrack of this game um, yeah, for sure. Uh, I believe we're moving on to our next topic, and it's going to be overworld explanation. And one of the things that I do want to mention right away 
is about the, uh, say, riding on a horse. And if you run into a low-level enemy, you don't even have to ba uh, battle him. And I'm going to say this till I'm blue in the face. Every RPG should do that shit. If you're way mm -hmm. overleveled and you're not going to get any experience out of it, take a note from Earthbound and don't make you do the fight. So I'm yeah. happy they did that because I feel like that is such a pain in the ass. Like, some games is a little different. Like, Pokemon is so centered around catching things. I get it in Pokemon. Um, another RPG that we mentioned, uh, say, like, Persona 5. But Persona 5 does it. Persona 5, you run into an enemy and you ambush them and they're so low level, you just get to get the mask or something like that. I do feel like that yeah. should be a thing that every RPG should do. But also, as you're traveling through the overworld, I do also like the fact that because of the way that the enemies are placed, you do have a choice of who you face and who you actually fight in battle. So yeah, it might be more rare to say, like we mentioned before, like to find a metal slime. But it is really cool to see that every, almost every enemy that you face is a choice besides, say, like a mini boss or an actual boss. And the ways that you traverse the world, like say you defeat an enemy and then like you're able to jump super high because you're in that weird egg machine uh, machine thing. I thought it was also a very creative touch. To be able to keep going from point A to point B a little more interesting than just running or running or riding on a horse. Yeah, no, I agree. I The, the overall was cool. Um, I, I definitely feel, you know, I mean, you kind of touched on a lot of it, so I kind of just want to be like, I agree with what Nick said. <laughs> uh, because it, it was cool, and it wasn't just like running around. I feel like a lot of JRPGs are just like kind of running through a map. Um, what was the one I just beat recently? Tales of Asperia mm -hmm. um, was a lot like this, where in Tales of Asperia, you're kind of running around, and it, it's really nicely designed, mm -hmm. um, but you're kind of just walking. Um, and when you jump somewhere, you kind of press A, and your character, like, man, like, automatically hops. Yeah. Um, but I, I really like how in Dragon Quest, there's, like, so many things you interact with. Um, so it's not just walking and then jumping and then walking more. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different enemies you can interact with. There's, like, walls you climb up and things like that. So I think it was a lot more interactive, which was nice. It made the, the grind of just walking a lot easier. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, you don't necessarily have to fight enemies. Um, the horse makes it easy, but also they're kind of fairly easy to avoid a lot of the time anyway, too. Yeah. Um, um, which I like and you can see them you can kind of work your way around them So it doesn't like force you into grindy fights unless you need to mm -hmm. um, Which I really appreciate so I I love the overall design. Oh, yeah, I thought it was fantastic Also like the uh, all, all the areas. I mean that's kind of a requirement also when it comes down to RPGs nowadays You kind of have to have more unique settings uh, and more, right. more unique enemies and whatnot which they all did and a lot of the things that you expect an RPG to do They did very well, but like the extra attention of detail with like saying uh so, like, you hop on a slime and you're able to jump on a slime just to make it a little more fun for you and whatnot, just because you're riding on a horse the entire time, and then you run into a slime or, uh, or something that you can just hop on them, and I think they're actually technically they're called slime knights, and then you're just, uh, the ways that they give you a different way to be able to travel throughout the world, I think was such a unique way to, uh, to do it. Because I think one of the hardest things mm -hmm. when it comes down to an RPG to do and be able to distinguish itself for sure is to find a unique way to do so. Because a lot of the times RPGs kind of fall into a template of run, fight, run, fight, maybe a cutscene or a story every now and then, maybe with some side quests also. They want to try to find a way to kind of break that repetition because that gameplay loop is obviously, I mean, I enjoy it. I'm sure Mike enjoys it as well. But um, it might not incentivize everybody to do so. So people that aren't typical right. RPG or people who don't typically uh, appeal to that or like that kind of gameplay loop would probably stay away. So I do think that Dragon Quest mm -hmm. did a lot of things that were very good ways to meet them halfway. So it does give them a little more to do and to explore on the overworld. And I think if I remember correctly, there's a couple areas where you actually needed uh, needed uh, w one of those uh, people to, I think maybe like a Slime Knight or whatnot. Maybe I'm wrong. I can't remember for sure. But you need that kind of way to traverse the world to get to like, say, under, uh, under a cave in the water or something like that. Or uh, something right. to be able to get a specific item. I don't, I don't know for sure, but I do think that uh, that what they did was a was a good way to approach it. So, absolutely, yeah. Overworld's really cool, really good in this game. Um, and I guess now we're gonna take a little bit of a lap back to the battle systems. So, before we mentioned the battle system, we mentioned that we, well, we like the leveling, the way to get abilities, uh, but we never really actually talked about what was unique about the battle system. And I do think it does a couple of things that are uh, pretty unique. One of the main ones was pet powers. Uh, pet powers are a way that honestly can kind of turn the tide of battle. They kind of can feel like a... To me, they kind of are, are, uh, are related to desperation moves when it comes down to Final Fantasy VI. But the uh, the idea of pet powers really... Um, 
they're really a way to, and there's a way to also induce it through, I believe, items and uh, certain situations, but they're kind of sporadic. They kind of, uh, they kind of come at you at random times, and they are that kind of ultimate move that you can kind of expect to be either a ton of damage, a big, uh, a big uh, buff for your party. But the way that they approached the turn-based combat in the game, I do feel was a little more unique. And I do feel like it was very needed, because a lot of people, especially modern gamers, when they look at a turn-based combat system, they don't really think that a game like Dragon Quest would do a lot different than, say, what it did 15, 20 years ago. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Mike, do you want to take it from there? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I guess I'll just kind of give my overall thoughts on the battle system, okay. you know, too. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, I, well, I, it's just, you know... I, I I don't know. I, I really enjoyed it. And you also kind of cut out on my end a little bit, so I think I kind of missed some of the stuff you were saying. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Um, you know, so, but, you know, just kind of my overall thing, I I really liked the battle system. Um, I, I I particularly, um, and I, I've mentioned this a lot, you know, I, I, I've mentioned a lot that I've mentioned it a lot. Uh, it's mm -hmm. very simple and very easy to get into. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of, like, the powers in it and stuff, there's there's so much you can do, and there's a lot of diversity in it, um, but it's also very textbook JRPG. Mm -hmm. um, so on the flip side of that, if you're familiar with the JRPG genre, there's, like, so many skills and abilities that it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I'm used to, to buffing speed and buffing power and, you know, defending and the different spells and things like that. So a lot of it is very textbook, um, but, like, but like you were mentioning with pet powers, you know, I think that was such a, a unique idea that I, I really, really liked mm -hmm. um, because it, it kind of changes the flow of battle. Um, and some of the pet powers are very much uh, do a devastating attack to the enemy, but some of them are a little bit different where mm -hmm. it's like, you know, you maybe have an extra shield or you're impervious to this or your characters have like max attack or some of them even have like little like, like uh, I don't know what the word is, like downsides to them. Like your mm -hmm. defense goes away is down, but you're like insanely powerful for these turns. And so uh, th their situations were very different. And I remember I used quite a few of them, um, mm -hmm. not really knowing what they were or thinking they wouldn't be very effective. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I could totally see a place where this would be useful. Mm -hmm. um, so there was just so much variety to them that I, I really liked. I felt like it it kept it, kept it fresh um, and kind of like added a different kind of element to the game. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. One thing that I thought was a pain in the ass, though, was you know how you had certain like missions where it's just like uh, destroy an enemy with this pet power, and some of the pet powers mm -hmm. also involve having two or three party members all having it at the same time. So you can store mm -hmm. it for later, but there's no guarantee it stays. So I will say that yeah. is one of the frustrating things, uh, one of the things that I found very frustrating, because if I was trying to do a lot of the side quests to be able to get some of the extra side rewards, it's a little mm -hmm. bit of randomness, a little bit of RNG if you're actually going to get people to line up to have that pet power at the same time to be able to use right. it. But it is a kind of a nice way to be able to get people's like, hey, pet powers exist. Make sure you use them because they can be very helpful. So I don't know. It's a give right. and take, but I will. I would say that it was kind of frustrating. But yeah, it's nothing mm -hmm. really special. I just wanted to touch on it because it does feel like a typical turn-based combat system, but it does feel unique enough that... And I do feel like it does enough in this day and age that makes that does make it stand out compared to like everybody else is trying to do something wacky or cool. It's not trying to be a bravely default. It's not trying to be a, a Final Fantasy VII remake or anything when it comes down to a battle system. It is trying to do something that has been proven to work, but giving it enough of a twist right. that it feels fresh, which is nice. Mm -hmm. All right, Mike, we're going into the enemies this time. We're going into them. You ready? Do you have your enemies that you have really cool names for? Because we're going to be talking about some puns now. Uh, I, I, I did, but I closed it, so you do yours first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I just want to have it, uh, have this as a shout-out for some of the names of the uh, names of the enemies, because they're pretty damn good. Obviously, we all know about the, like, the iconic design of the slime, but I just want to share some of the enemies that I thought were just pretty funny, and really just kind of... They, they might have existed in other Dragon Quest games, but I don't know. I think they should have a spotlight. Uh, one of them was a lamping... I thought that was pretty good. It was like a mixture of a lantern, but it was also an enemy. Uh, one of the obvious ones that I thought was uh, I thought was really awesome was uh, this is for a completely different reason, but uh, <laughs> it's a character called Lips. It looks like a kind of like a lizard, uh, a lizard kind of thing with like kind of alien eyes or whatnot. The reason I think it's funny though is because of a really stupid Twitter uh, Twitter thing that I saw, and it's about. Uh, <laughs> It's about a professional Smash Bros. player, and they, they literally put it side by side with the porch. He's like, man, I can't believe this guy got into the new Dragon Quest game. And he was just pissed. I don't know. I <laughs> thought it was really funny. 
<laughs> but then also the ones like Stump Chump. I don't know. Almost every single one of the things that I think a huge highlight of this game series overall is definitely the enemy design. Yeah, you got the great characters. Yeah, you got the great music. Yeah, you got the classic battle system and whatnot. Uh, you got the good... Uh, Got the good combat system. But the enemies in this game is what really pushes Dragon Quest to the point where it's just like, this is a game that's fun, to, this is a game that's just really fun to run into battles. Because it doesn't have the incentive that, yeah. say, like a Pokemon does or a Persona does, where there is kind of a collecting aspect of it. There's just the genius of the enemy designs. And to be honest, I think that's all you need. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mike, which ones did yeah. you like? Uh, <laughs> I don't have a lot to add, but I do want to say some really cool ones that I, I now pulled up that I really liked. Mm -hmm. uh, Sham Hat Witch. I loved that one. The one with like the little. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yep, that one's a classic. Uh, you know, uh, what was the other one? I know you mentioned Stump Chump. Uh, mm -hmm. I liked Platypunk. And then the, the version that came later, which was a pun of the pun, Splatterpunk. Uh, <laughs> I remember they that. They just kind of, they mixed two and one there. Uh, I, there's just so many like little cute ones like that. You know, there's like, uh, I don't know, looking down this list that I have here, like Calamari Kid or Exoskeleton. I think uh, Calamari Kid before was, do you know if he's an earlier version of Squid Kid? Because I know that one's like a rhyme thing. That's, that's kind of great too. I don't remember which was the uh, original, okay, or, okay. but they go together. I do know yeah, that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. There's just like a lot of like cool ones like that, like like knock it for orchid. They just have like a lot of little puns on words, mm -hmm. which is funny because then they have some that are just like skeleton. And yeah. It's like, oh, this guy didn't get a special name. Uh. But yeah, they have a lot of cool names, which I I, I really appreciate. That's like one of those little touches that makes this game stand apart to me. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, like that would have been a fun team to been a part of. In designing this game oh Just yeah coming up with puns for all these creatures yeah not a instead of colossus but it's a it's a colossus of coral so it's coral losses also there's uh there's a, a yeah. cy clown so instead of like cyclone there's like a guy in there sticking his tongue out like it's like i really do feel like one mm -hmm. of the one of the things that you definitely go to dragon quest 4 is definitely the enemy designs because I feel like yeah. all of them, especially even in the battle too, they're so animated and they feel so unique too. And I mean, a lot of them, the animations aren't anything too crazy, but I mean, like say when you have like a cruel cumber or something like that, as he dies, his spear flies into the air and impales himself as he vanishes. Like, that's amazing. Yeah. Like, and that's just a normal everyday fight. So that right. kind of, that kind of thing I do think pushes Dragon Quest, at least Dragon Quest 11, because I'll be honest, they had a lot of the same designs, like Golem or whatnot, and, uh, and Slimes in, uh, in Dragon Quest VII, but I never really feel like they stuck out as much. Mm -hmm. But in Dragon Quest XI, they definitely stuck out to me, so I thought that was pretty cool. But, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm I'm ready to give my closing thoughts, Mike, if you are. Yeah, I, I'm pretty much good to go. Um, and I'll go first. Um, I, I like I, I Again, you know, like I said, this, this game was really cool, and it, it kind of came out of nowhere for me. Um, you know, I, I wasn't really looking for another like 50 plus hour game to play. Uh, but again, you know, shout out to Xbox Game Pass because I, I freaking love that thing. And random games like this just come out for free left and right. And I'm like, okay, I'll give it a shot. Save 60 bucks. Uh, and, too. and this one is really cool. Yeah, I don't think I would have played it otherwise, at least not recently, because mm. you know, it's a long game. Uh, but but I'm glad I did. And I think, you know, the, I know we kept story to a minimum to avoid spoilers, but like, trust me when I say like the story in the second half is. It, it's phenomenal. Um, just kind of the development with the characters and what they go through. Um, it's a very optimistic looking game, but it has a very like dark undertone. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's cool like seeing that positivity kind of shine through. You know, it's a traditional all hope is lost and you know, there's one shining light to save it all. And you know, um, but it, it's not, it, it's cliched, but the game I feel like understands it's cliched. And I feel like mm -hmm. that's the point is, it's not trying to be anything crazy. It's trying to stick to what people love. And in this day and age where everyone around it is trying something new it's kind of nice that there's a game that's playing it safe or not even playing it safe but doing the doing the old school way mm -hmm. um, i really appreciate that because it's hard to find a game like this you know like nick mentioned bravely default persona 5 uh these are really great games but really great games that are trying to spin the turn-based combat um it, it was nice that this is a game that's like nope we're gonna keep it as textbook as we can the the system in the game um feels like an 90s RPG, mm -hmm. um, just with updated graphics and a, and a great story, and so I, I really appreciate that. If you're looking for like an old school retro touch, uh, this is the game. It's a lot of fun. I completely agree. I do think again, it, the game has a couple very like minor things that kind of bugged me. Not really anything too big. Again, the pet powers thing was probably one of my biggest complaints, which is really such a minor complaint. We're just like, God dang it, I'm trying to get this stupid side quest finished, but it's RNG right. to when I get it finished. Stuff like that, yeah. I can I can easily look past. There's a like when I was like looking at games like Lost Sphere, I had pretty big problems with that with that kind of game, and I think there's pretty big flaws overall. But in this game, there 
It was just overall a very solid game from start to finish. Very consistent, there was not really many low points, if any. The enemy designs were extremely varied, which was awesome. I liked the characters, I liked I liked a lot of the side content that happened, and it really was, in my in my mind, a close to a fully realized world, too. I feel like um, one of the things that people might get the per, uh, perspective of with all these definitive editions and all this other stuff that's being released for the game, that it might not have been finished when it came when it, uh, when it was released, but it pretty much was the full package when it was released. But it's just such a good game; they want everybody to be able to experience it. So they actually did make like uh, they ported it to the Switch, they bring it over to Xbox Game Pass, and I do feel like it's a game right. that deserves that kind of treatment. One thing that I do want to yeah. mention that I didn't use as much as I did is if you guys remember a long time ago, one of the things that I was really holding out on was the DMake version of this game. Mm -hmm. And the DMake version of the game actually came with the Nintendo Switch, and I was super excited to try it out. Um, but the way that it was implemented didn't feel as seamless. It wasn't as simple as the rest of the game, kind of a big theme of what we really liked about the game. The, uh, the way that it was implemented is you had certain checkpoints, and you can go back to certain checkpoints and you can play up to those, but you weren't able to say when you go to the cathedral to switch into the mode, there wasn't that easy transition. You would have to like redo some of the story right. elements to get up there. And to me, I was just like, okay, it was a really cool story and concept, but the feel of the game, it felt like it was more to be played in that in the 3D world with all the voice acting and whatnot. So I thought it was a really cool idea. And while I may probably did like the beginning story sections in the 2D mode, I didn't really do much else past that. It was a really cool idea. But it was just, mm -hmm. a, it was, and, I'm, and I like it for, I guess, history's sake or prosperity's sake that I'll still have it as an option. But personally, I think that it was, it was a way more fitting game to play in 3D. So I did enjoy that. Yeah. But I do think like overall as a game, I think it was just solid. I mean, I think I had it as one of my favorite, ga uh, one of my favorite uh, games of the year, even though I, I probably didn't play like any games that got released that year besides Dragon <laughs> Quest. So it's a really good game and if it's not um if we if us didn't convince you i mean hopefully other people might be able to do so in the comments too because i do feel like this game is a very good one even if you're not a turn-based uh turn-based person i think it'd be worth it for you to give it a, give it a try if not for the art style alone because the art because uh mm. the art style really does give a different life to this game than you would really expect it doesn't feel like say an atlas rpg it doesn't feel like a square enix R well it is a square enix rpg but it doesn't feel like some of the more recent square enix rpgs <laughs> which is a cool thing yeah so yeah i i think i've said my piece same with Sweet, you yeah. same here all right cool so that's going to be doing it for our game breakdown of dragon quest 11 uh, please let us know what you think if you've played the game. I know some of the people that I've talked to in stream have also really enjoyed it. So please let us know if there's any other points that we forgot that we that you think is very important to mention. But otherwise, thank you for joining us, and we will see you guys in the next time. Yeah. Adios, everyone. Bye-bye.